Good morning, guys. So excited to be gathering with you. I know you're sitting at home, you're watching on TVs, phones, tablets, but man, welcome. Welcome if you are a member of the Springs, you've been tracking us for a long time, or welcome if you have just stumbled across the Springs online and you found us, you're wrestling with faith and you don't know what to believe about God. Wherever you are in the midst of um, COVID-19, this pandemic, social distancing, we want to do our best to connect with you. So whether you're a member and you got questions or you're looking to grow in an area with your community group or you're thinking through taking the next step towards membership, or if you're just wrestling with faith entirely, we would love the chance to talk with you. Now talking these days, it typically looks like a virtual meeting, but I tell you what, we have gotten really good at virtual meetings. So with that, guys, if you want to connect with us, the easiest way to do that is by going to our website. That's springsmb-connect. From that, you'll be able to see a few options for learning new things about the church, finding prayer, getting connected, things like that. Second thing I want to let you guys know about before we jump into the sermon today is that we are about to launch, I'm so excited for this, a weekly family fun activity. So what that'll look like is every week we're going to be sending out, we're going to be partnering with some of our members, some leaders, sending out this family fun activity where we're going to gather virtually, do everything from games to scavenger hunts, all socially distanced, all safe, everything like that, is a fun way to remind one another that even in the midst of a time where there's a greater sense of physical isolation, what should not go down is laughter. What should not go down is that real sense of connection. So if you want to find out more information on that, we'll send an email this week to our email list. But also, we'd encourage you guys to follow us on social media. You can track with everything The Springs is doing now through Facebook, through Instagram, through Twitter. Oh, wait, I've been told no one uses Twitter besides me, and I have 10 followers, so shameless plug. Just join me on Twitter. But all those different places, you can come and get information about, hey, what's going on this week? Because that's the thing, guys, is we've shifted. There's still a tremendous amount of energy and discipleship that's taking place Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. We want to keep you guys in the loop. Everything from growing in the knowledge and the love of God, just finding creative ways to laugh with one another. We want to do our best because here's what we know is true here at the Springs. We are better together. So it's with that in the mind, I want to pray, and I'm excited to jump into the passage that we have this morning. So please, pray with me. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the chance for us to come together, for us to gather, for us to open your word and remind ourselves of what is true. Lord, I'm asking that uh, as people sit on couches and kids are running around and it's hectic and there's breakfast in the background perhaps or they're trying to focus and it's just a different environment these days. Lord, would you help us to align our hearts to you? Would you do what only you can do? And that's help us to become more like you. I can't do that. Only you can. I thank you knowing that you love answering that prayer. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Guys, I'm so excited to be jumping in with y'all, and here's why. We are going to jump into a new book of the Bible. It's not a new book in the Bible, but it's going to be a new book for us. We're going to be working our way through 2 Timothy. Now, if you are with us last week, we talked about leadership, and we actually taught out of 2 Timothy. And even as I reflected on that section, it really reinforced for me just this thought of, this is the absolute book that we need to jump into, that we need to be in right now. And here's a little bit of the reason why. 2 Timothy, it's a letter written by the Apostle Paul. He's this big-time church leader, missionary, pastor, preacher, all that kind of stuff. And he's writing this letter of encouragement to a young church leader, Timothy. Like Paul was his mentor, Timothy was the mentee. And he's writing this letter to a church leader to tell him to be faithful even in the midst of opposition to be faithful even when it gets difficult. And the reason I thought about that is that if you're at home and you're watching this, if you're a member of the Springs, right? Or if you're just a believer in Jesus Christ, here's what's true. You are called to be a faithful church leader. See, church leadership, that's not my job. That is the job of the church. Who is the church? That is the people of God, those who believe in him. My daughter last night, she said, hey, hey, daddy, daddy, can we go to church? Can we go to church? I love that my daughter says that, right? But even there from three years old, and you give her tons of love, tons of grace. I mean, she's three. She doesn't know up from down, literally. But I looked at her and said, hey, sweetie, those who believe in Jesus are the church. It's not a place. It is a people. 
I share that with you guys because the whole reason that I really think God wants to have us jump into 2 Timothy is to strengthen your leadership, to strengthen my leadership. Because what we're not short of right now is trying to be faithful in the midst of fear and opposition. To give you a little more specific context for 2 Timothy, here's what was going on. Again, as I shared, Paul was Timothy's mentor. A lot of scholars think Paul actually led Timothy to Christ. And then what Paul at least did was he discipled Timothy in the faith. Timothy followed Paul. Paul had gone and he planted this church in Ephesus, right? And then he'd moved on. But later on, he sent Timothy, his kind of spiritual apprentice, back to pastor that church in Ephesus. Paul's writing this letter at a time where Timothy's pastoring the church there. He's also writing this time where he's in a prison cell. Now, Paul, his faithfulness, being persecuted for his belief in Jesus Christ, he's in prison literally multiple times. But this was a prison sentence right towards the end of his life. Paul's writing this letter to a church leader, to one that, as we're going to see, he deeply loves, that he legitimately cares about. He's writing this letter from prison to this young, faithful church leader, saying, I know it's hard. Keep going. Faithfulness is worth it. See, Timothy, he's pastoring in this time, right? It's probably about 64 AD, somewhere between 64 AD and 67. He's pastoring this time in Ephesus, which was a Roman city, at a time when Christians are really being persecuted. Because here's what had happened. There was an emperor by the name of Nero. Nero, he was a bad guy. He was brutal. He was irresponsible. He was unkind. He would put Christians in in gladiator matches against animals, not a nice guy. While he was emperor, Rome burned for nine days. Approximately almost half of Rome burned over those nine days. Now, some scholars think Nero, he actually set Rome on fire so he could kind of usurp and get past the Senate. But here's what he did as a leader. He needed a scapegoat. He needed someone to blame the fires on. So who did he blame? The Christians, the people of the way. And so there, from Rome and then spreading out, there was tremendous persecution. So Timothy, this young pastor, striving to be a church leader, to be faithful, to endure hardship, to lead well, is caring for folks in the midst of extreme opposition. The second thing that was true is Paul's writing to Timothy. We we talked about this last week. Timothy was more naturally fearful. He was more naturally timid. You see it a few places in scripture, and you'll see it in this book. And the reason why I'm excited to jump into 2 Timothy is because it really demonstrates, right, for you and for me, we are called to be faithful, even when it's difficult. We are called to honor God in areas of our life, even when it's challenging. And guys, I don't don't have to remind y'all, we are not short of challenges right now. That's my hope. The part that I love about this too is really that this letter, you could say, Paul, the the summary of it, he's calling Timothy to faithful endurance, enduring leadership. But he's going to start by doing something a little different. See, the majority of the letter is going to be instruction to Timothy. Hey, Timothy, I know it's hard. Keep going. Hey, Timothy, I know it's difficult. Keep going. Here's the difficulty in the present. Hey, Timothy, it's going to get harder in the future. He's going to call him to more, but it's amazing how Paul starts it. You'd think Paul would start it by saying, hey, Timothy, I know you're down. Hey, Timothy, I know it's hard. Get it together. Hey, Timothy, I know it's been rough. I know you're fearful. Hey, man, come on, pick it up. You got to do better. We tend to motivate that way sometimes. That's not how Paul motivates. That's not how Paul starts to inspire this faithful church leadership in this, in this pastor. He actually starts by reminding him of love. So guys, where we're going to be today, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Specifically in this context is the rest of the letter, Paul, he's going to exhort, he's going to challenge, he's going to call Timothy to faithfulness. He's going to start by doing something a little different. He's going to start by first reminding Timothy of not, hey man, get it together, of not, hey, do better, but of, hey, Timothy, here's how much I love you. Hey, Timothy, here's how much you mean to me. I believe in you. He speaks life into him. Today, we're going to talk about how a call to faithfulness starts with a reminder 
of love. I'll say that again. A call to faithfulness starts with a reminder of love. So if you have a Bible, turn with me. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Again, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5, and we're going to see really a few things happen. But Paul, he's going to remind Timothy of his love for him by one, loving him. Two, thanking God for him. Three, praying for Timothy. And then four, reminding Timothy of his faithfulness. So I'm going to read all of uh, verses one through five, and we're going to work our way down through. So grab your Bible with me, 2 Timothy chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Before we keep going, that right there, it's kind of a standard introduction for Paul when he goes and he sends these letters, right? And now it's going to shift and it's going to get more personal towards Timothy. It really highlights this idea. Paul's writing this letter to Timothy, but he knew it was going to be read and used as Holy Spirit-inspired instruction for other people. People like you, people like me. So here's the personal part where Paul, he really begins to speak to Timothy. He says to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience is I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Guys, again, here's what we're doing. We're, We're pausing right here at the end of these five verses to stop and see what Paul's doing is he's reminding Timothy of how much he loves him. He's encouraging him. He's speaking life into him before he's gonna go and challenge him, call him to faithfulness, exhort him to excel still more. So that's what we're gonna see, guys. How does he do that? How does Paul, right, as we know he's gonna call him to faithfulness, how does he start by reminding him of love? Well, let's pick it up in verse to where really you see the first way that Paul starts by reminding Timothy of love is he just reminds him, man, I love you. I legitimately care. I love how it starts out. He says, hey, to Timothy, my beloved child. I referenced this a little bit before, but the scholars say, Paul, he likely led Timothy to Christ on one of his missionary journeys, and then he raised Timothy in the faith. You see, actually, if you were to turn in your Bible a few pages to the left, in 1 Timothy, which is a letter he'd sent him before, You see him, Paul, addressing Timothy there as Timothy, my faithful son in the faith. It's this amazing moment where really you see this contrast and this difference in 1 Timothy and 2. Both are these moments of um, affirmation, affection, and intimacy, but you see it change in 2 Timothy a little bit. We don't know exactly why that changed is, but some scholars, they speculate. It's because where Paul is in his life. Like Paul's writing this from a prison cell where he really sincerely thinks he's going to die. Church history has it that Paul was martyred, right? Some think, some say likely that he was beheaded. The time of that would have come perhaps following the persecution that was taking place under Nero. So Paul writing this letter to a young, faithful church leader, one he loved, one he walked with, one he raised in the faith. He's saying, I sincerely love you. He uses beloved. That's language that God has for those who believe. He calls him child. That's true of God's family for us. Your Bible, it may translate as son. You see, Paul, he starts by reminding Timothy of, I sincerely care for you. You see this show up a little later down in the passage. Like we're going to jump past the rest of um, verse two and we'll jump to verse four. It says, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. This doubling down where Paul's saying how much he loves Timothy, how much he cares for him. There would have been a moment in the past where Paul and Timothy would have been together. He either wrote him a letter or they were in person where Paul is there engaging Timothy in the difficulty of faithful, enduring leadership. And what's marking Timothy in that moment? Tears. He's likely overwhelmed. He's perhaps fearful and worried. And Paul's saying, man, I remember when you wept. And then he talks about how how he's in prison. He says, hey, Tim, come and see me if you can. Because when I see you, man, I'm filled with joy. I love this because Paul is going to call Timothy to faithfulness. But guys, where does he start? He starts with an affirmation of how much he loves him. Have you ever heard the idea of people don't care what you know 
until they know that you care. One of the things I can remember, especially when uh, parenting was first new, hearing language of, hey, before you go to correct a child, connect. It's this idea of, hey, even when you come and you call people to more, which church we are meant to do, you as a church leader yourself is meant to be called to more as well as you are meant to be used by God to call other believers to more. You know what Paul's modeling? He's saying the best foundation of where you start is you remind them of how much you love them. And guys, here's what's true. You can't fake that. Like even back in verse two, right? Paul, he continues with this benediction. It's a blessing there where he says, hey, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. It's this amazing blessing and encouragement. The question is, do you think Paul really meant that? Like what type of sincerity would have been there? Because guys, people listen to you when you think, when they think, excuse me, that you actually care about them. I can remember... Before I'd moved to New Braunfels, I was serving on staff at a, at a church in Dallas, and I was part of a homeless ministry. We would come, we'd pick up homeless folks, we'd do everything to disciple in faith, help them get connected, transition off streets, sober living, all, all those kinds of aspects. But part of the ministry, we'd take them with us to church. We would try to connect them to the community of faith. You're meant to be a part of a body. And we would bring them, and here was the thing, guys. We would bring folks, it was like wheels off, wild, wild west. It was crazy, but it was beautiful, it was glorious. Right? I can remember, and this is before I was on staff at the church there, right? there was a, a staff member who knew we were bringing and the numbers of folks just kept growing and the way that we had to shepherd and care and protect, we were having to get better at that. I can remember the staff member came up to me, right? And he, he had a good heart, but he came up and I'll never forget. He said, man, can I just encourage you with something? And I'm sitting there, like I was newer to faith. I'm growing, we're caring for homeless people. I totally agree. It was like the wild, wild west. It was kind of crazy. We need to put some better structure around this thing. And he came up and I thought, man, he noticed. He's gonna encourage. I don't even know this guy. That's so kind of him. And he just came and he just ripped apart the whole ministry. He just showed us every problem that was with it. Was he having a bad day? Maybe. Grace to him. There was a lot of truth in what he said though. I do have to acknowledge that. But I can remember standing there and thinking two things. Man, don't say you're going to encourage me if you're not going to encourage me. And two, man, I don't even know you. Here's, here's why I share that story. So many times when we call people to faithfulness, we start with the critique. We don't start with the connection, right? We start with the challenge, not the reinforcement of love. Guys, the faithfulness that Paul is modeling for us in, in your life is your call to faithfulness, is we call others to faithfulness, is to come and say, a call to faithfulness starts with a reminder of love. Starts by saying, I sincerely care. And here's the thing, y'all. If you go to challenge people, if you go to encourage them to faithfulness, you can't fake that. Like people try to fake that and it's insincere. N nothing does more than an insincere call to that. If people don't really believe that you're for them, if people don't really believe you're coming in humility with love, it's a heart to care, not to tear down. So guys, as we evaluate our own uh, church leadership, our own faithfulness, our own endurance in the midst of opposition, you gotta start from a place of love. Let's look at the second thing that Paul's gonna use here as he goes on kind of uh, engaging Timothy. It, it's right there, it comes out right at the start of verse three. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, is I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Now, there's two things that Paul's doing here, but as he continues to kind of say, hey, is I'm going to call you to faithfulness. I'm going to remind you of how much I love you. The second thing he does is that before he loves, now he's going to thank. He's going to thank. Like Paul has a legitimate heart of gratitude towards Timothy. Here's what I think is the, the amazing thing in that. Paul knew Timothy so well because in this moment where Timothy, he's struggling in leadership, he's having a hard moment, he, he's down, he's fearful, he's facing opposition, right? Paul comes and he remembers the entirety of Timothy's life. How Timothy has been a tremendous gift to him. How Timothy, as he remarks elsewhere in scripture, he is a huge gift to the church. And he has this heart of Timothy, I am sincerely and I am deeply grateful for you. 
One of the things that I can always do better is trying to keep perspective. Here's, here's what I mean, right? I can tend to get caught up in one moment, in one interaction. In particular, this can happen with family a lot of times, right? Or even my daughter, Lily, there's a difficult interaction or there's disobedience and I can get caught up in that. And I can lose this broader perspective of how grateful, privileged, and appreciative I am for her. Paul, in this moment, while he's going to encourage Timothy to faithfulness, he's going to stop and first reflect on in sincerity. I'm so grateful for you, Timothy. I'm so thankful for all you've done. Guys, how do we do it doing that with our spouses? Like, how do we do it developing a heart of gratitude for our spouses when we come home from work and they're there and they've been working or they've been out at work and then they come home? Do we have a heart of gratitude for how they help in everything? Do you see the totality of the faithfulness? Or do you just focus on the moment? One of the things that's true, my daughter Lily, so we're working on uh, being polite, things like that. So for us, that, that's a lot of please, thank yous, things along those lines, where there's this question, and I bet kids at home, you probably heard this question, right? There'll be things where we'll give her something, we'll hand her food, or we'll do things like that, and then we'll look at her and we'll say, okay, what do you say, sweetheart? Right? You at home, you probably know the answer to that. The answer to that question is typically, thank you, or please, sometimes, this is what we're working on too, you're welcome, right? And we'll always ask this question, hey, What do we say, sweetheart? Church, when it comes to loving people, when it comes to shepherding people, there's this truth where we need to ask ourselves way more often, what do I say? Not not what do I ask of them, what do I say? Thank you. Like Springs members, thank you for your faithfulness. Springs families, thank you for your faithfulness. People fighting in the midst of difficult marriages, thank you for your faithfulness. Singles fighting to battle against isolation, depression, and loneliness, thank you for your faithfulness. We gotta develop a heart of gratitude. Because here's what's true, when you grow in a gratitude for someone, sincere gratitude, and you call them to that, they wanna follow that. That they want to be a part of that. Because guys, here's what's true. A call to faithfulness, which we are meant to do in our own lives and in the lives of others, starts with a reminder of love. It starts with a reminder of thanks. Let's jump back into the passage. Let's keep keep moving along. Oh, we're going to stay in verse 3. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, is I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. I love this because it seems so obvious, but I think this is such a a neglected truth uh, for Christians, right? If if you want to call someone to faithfulness and you remind them of love, the third way Paul's really reminding Timothy, the third way Paul's doing that with Timothy is he prays for Timothy. It's prayer. It's legitimate going before the God in heaven on behalf of that soul. I love this language because Paul says, I constantly pray for you. What what he's talking about there is just his his prayerful attitude. How his dialogue with God never has a the end. How the phone is never hung up. It's a constant communication. That doesn't mean he's just locked away in the closet all day. But that means his heart and dialogue before God is constantly going. And then what is he constantly thinking of? He's reminding himself of Timothy. He's knowing it's hard to lead. Life is difficult. There's opposition in this world. We will have trouble. Timothy faces trouble the same way I do. Timothy has bad days just like I do. Timothy has good moments and bad moments just like I do. Just like you do. Just like I do. And he prays. One of the greatest things you can do for someone, especially if there's tension with them, or you want to grow in love for them, is you actively discipline yourself to pray for them. Man, one of the things that happened to me, we we do corporate prayer at the Springs every Thursday morning. You're always invited. We're doing it virtually, right? If you want to get connected to that, just go to springsandbead.org backslash connect. Would love to have you join us. This past week, we we go and we pray for this extended time. And my friend Jimmy, at the end of it, we've wrapped it up. And he just kind of graciously, kindly pauses. And he says, hey, John, can I just pray for you? 
He was so kind, he just prayed for basically this. Faithful leadership. Faithful submission to God in my life and from that calling other people in love to more. Man, I just spend 45 minutes praying for the springs, praying for community, praying for health, praying for national leaders, praying for those impacted financially, praying for everyone with this group. And then he stops and there's this moment where he prays for me. Guys, it was like this boost of spiritual energy to my soul. It just communicated this gratitude. How are we doing at the people we want to see uh, grow in faith? at the community group that you want to see change, at the spouse that you see that you wish would love you different, for for the boss that doesn't treat you the way that you think, for the neighbor that's not responding to the gospel in the way that you hope. How are we doing at being people of prayer? Because here's what's true, guys. Prayer is not for the disciplined. It's for the desperate. Desperate to see God move and God change in lives. Do you want to remind people and call them to faithfulness. You remind them of your love. One of the greatest demonstrations of love is prayer. Let's look at the last one. I love this one. We've already worked our way through verse four, so I'm gonna jump to verse five. This is where um, Paul, he knew Timothy's family. He knew Timothy's kind of family tree, if you will, and he's gonna remind him of the faithfulness that he's seen in them. Verse five. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. You know who is a rock star in the kingdom of heaven? Lois. You know who is a rock star in the kingdom of heaven? Eunice. You know who benefited from all of that? Timothy and Paul. You and me. It's this amazing moment right here, guys, because what Paul's doing is, again, he's going to call Timothy to faithfulness, right? And he's going to start by reminding him of love. But but the fourth way he's going to do that, he's going to remind him of his faithfulness. He's going to remind him of the faithfulness that he already sees. But he starts by drawing this beautiful, like, family tree, like this Christian lineage, if you will, that started with his grandmother, Lois, a faithful saint. And what did Lois do? Poured into a faithful saint, Eunice. From that, what do you see? Faithful saint in Timothy. Now, here's what's true. God's sovereign over all of that. But does he use family to raise up the next generation? Absolutely. There's a few interesting points that I want to point out, though. One, you don't see Timothy's father referenced here. You see his mother. You don't see Timothy's grandmother referenced here. Or excuse me, grandfather. You see his grandmother. Now, now what was true of his parents, I, I don't entirely know. But here's what I think that speaks to. Whether you have both parents in the home, you're a single parent. God in heaven wants to use you to raise up the faithful next generation. Whether you're inheriting the faith from the ones before you or it starts with you, he wants to use you. I think the other thing that's true a lot of times when people come and they see this idea of like a discipleship in the family in the primary place, that's true. But what was the language if you remember back in verse two? What did Paul call Timothy? He says to Timothy, my beloved child. Your Bible, it may say son. Some people plead with God for the privilege of biological family in a different way than the way it is currently. You do not have to have the same sense of immediate family to know that God uses to mother, God uses you to mother, and that God uses you to father. Does that take away from that sense of loss? No, and I don't mean that. But what does that mean? Whoever you are, wherever you are, God wants to use you to establish the reminder of faithfulness that goes for generations. I was on a um, a call yesterday where I was talking with a couple, faithful couple men, and we're right here. We're talking about how they lead in marriage and what that looks like, how she follows and respects and what that looks like, and, and we're talking with the husband. And we learn in his background that one of the things that was true is he he had no real picture of Christian leadership, Christian love from his family. His first memory was remembering being beaten. And that wasn't something that was just a one-time thing. That continued. While grieving the reality of that tragic, wicked oppression and sin, 
we reminded him of the privilege that he now has to change the family tree, to lead a different branch, to have a different downline. See, here's what's true. Well, right there, in that instance, he couldn't look up two generations and see a Lois or a generation up, right, and see a Eunice. But God in heaven wants to use him, his wife, to generations below them, them to be able to look up and say, I saw them. So guys, here's what's true, right? is you call people to faithfulness, you remind them of love. And and what Paul's doing here is he's reminding Timothy, Timothy, I have seen your faithfulness. I have seen what God's done in you. Like there's this moment where pastors come together, they send out Timothy, Timothy, he's this church planner, he's this pastor, it's this thing. And Paul says, I've seen what God wants to do in you. He's speaking belief into him. He's speaking life. Here's what's beautiful. That had been happening for generations before that. Church, how are we doing at reminding one another in our own families as well as outside and what is true of the family of God, the church? How are we doing of reminding one another of our faithfulness? Reminding one another, no, here's what I've seen in you. I've seen it before. I see it now. Speaking that sense of belief into people. Guys, that's a call to faithfulness. It's a call to faithfulness that starts with a reminder of love. And that reminder of love is, hey, I know what Christ has done in you, is doing, and what has planned to do. It's a sense of excitement for it. Guys, here's where we've been. We've been in 2 Timothy chapter 1. We've been looking at verses 1 through 5. This whole book, the Apostle Paul, he's writing to Timothy from prison, writing to this church leader, facing difficulty in opposition, writing to him to say, hey, excel still more. I know it's hard. Keep going. Here's what faithfulness looks like. But I love how he starts it. He starts out by trying to to, to press into the heart of Timothy. Love. This truth of God has called you. God has sent you. He does it with love. He does it with thanks, he does it with prayer, and he does it by reminding him of his faithfulness. As I think about like, how how do we apply something like this? How do we apply something like this? I think there's a myriad of ways. One of the things I'd love for you guys to do just with your family or your roommates, or, or if you're there by yourself, jump on a phone call with some other folks watching this after and talk about something. But talk about what are ways that you can demonstrate, right? A reminder of love to people that are trying to be faithful. There's countless ways but here's a simple way that I thought of. I'd ask, and if you're a member of our body, right, or if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I'd ask you this. If you don't believe in Jesus, I, I, this, is, this isn't necessarily for you, but I still think it'd be a healthy exercise. I would write a letter to someone who grew faith in you, who has impacted your faith, who's nurtured you, right? This would be, like, for example here, Timothy to Paul. And then I'd write a second letter because we all know, guys, getting a letter these days, it's amazing. It's this communication of love. It takes so much time. Their hands are probably tired by the end of it. Write a second letter. And that second letter, let that be to someone that you are trying to humbly develop faithfulness in. And here's the goal of the letter. Gratitude. Love. Speaking a truth into them. And here's the thing, guys. The truth that you're speaking into them It's the truth that Christ has spoken to them. And it's the truth that Christ speaks to you. Because if you remember, we're jumping into this book because you and I, Christian, we are leaders of the church. If you're a believer in Jesus, this is something you can either accept, embrace, and grow in, and develop a gift that we'll talk about, that he wants to use you, fan it into flame. Or you can sit on the sidelines. Now, if you choose to sit on the sidelines, right, we're just going to plead with you to join. But those of us here, we are called to lead faithfully, no matter the opposition, no matter the difficulty, no matter the timidity, no matter the economy, no matter the employment rate, no no matter the uh, case morbidity rate of COVID-19, no matter how much longer we sit in isolation wishing we can return, no matter the circumstance, we are faithful. We call people to do that. And that call starts with love. I was so grateful, and I'll close with this. I got an email this week from a member of our body. Her name's Emmy, right? In this email, she shared part of her story. 
and it was just beautiful. She'd come, she'd hung out in the spring, she, her husband, her family, they'd spent some time. They actually got connected to Bible Study Fellowship, BSF, right? It's a discipleship group where they got connected into a group where there were some Springs members, and I think a few other folks. Some Springs members had come alongside her, and through that time, using God's word, investing into her life, God used them and others to, by his grace, lead her to Christ. She'd grown up around church. She'd been close to faith. She had been baptized in the past. And then there's this realization, wait, wait, I don't know the true, sincere, saving love of a God in heaven. A God in heaven who looks at me and as he calls me to faithfulness, how does he do it? It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. How does God start by leading you and leading me to faithfulness? He starts with love. Do you know that he's grateful for you? You're his inheritance. He prays, he intercedes on our behalf. And he reminds, he's literally given us the Holy Spirit as an assurance. It's this truth. And she realized all that, that God in heaven died for her sins, died for mine. He rose from the grave and he doesn't bid her to be this better version. He says, believe in me, believe, change your life, change your life. It's this beautiful story because after that, here's what happened. She comes to know Christ right? She jumps in, she gets more connected, she starts growing in her faith, and now God's growing in her this desire to grow in ministry and faithfulness and leadership, and what does that look like? And she's writing this beautiful email saying, here's what God's putting on my heart to do. But there's a bit of fear. There's a bit of worry. There's a bit of concern. Guys, God is looking to use you to transform lives like Emmys all day, every day. Your classroom the, the Zoom virtual gathering that you're a part of, the clinic you go to, the grocery store that you're at, he's looking to transform lives like Emmy's all the time. And where does that start for Emmy? Where does that start for me? Where does that start for you? With the reminder of God loves you. With the reminder of he died for you. He's made you worthy. With the reminder of he prays. He literally, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. He knows to pray what you don't know to pray. And what does he do? He reminds. He gives us his word. He gives us the assurance of the Holy Spirit. Church, Jesus Christ calls you, calls me to be a faithful church leader for such a time as this in good days and in bad, no matter the opposition. But how does he start that call? How does Paul start that call here with Timothy? with a reminder of love. We are called to faithfulness. And that call always starts with a reminder of love. So church, I'm calling you to faithfulness and I'm reminding you of God's love for you. I'm pleading with you to go, call others to faithfulness, yourself, your family, your friends, your community group. We are not meant to shrink back in the midst of everything. We are meant to lean in, city on a hill. You're a church leader, lead. This is not my job. This is not staff's job. This is not the trustee's job. This is our job. And where does that start? Paul shows us when we remind our love. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the everything that you do in our lives. I thank you for the chance that we have to, to gather virtually and to do this. God, would you just bless this time for families? Help them from this to go and talk about what are ways that we could remind people of love. Help us to be a people that are phenomenal in encouragement, that are supernaturally blessed. It's speaking life because that is what you do for us. Lord, I'd ask, lead people to know you change eternities, just like you did any. Do it again. Let us keep going. You're doing that all the time around here in the midst of quarantine or not. We thank you that you're finding us faithful. Do it with us. We love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Guys, thank y'all so much for gathering us. We hope that you're able to take the rest of the day, enjoy this time with family, friends, roommates, jump on a call if you're there by yourself, wherever you are. But one of the things we want to remind you guys is we are always looking to connect. So whether you're a member or, or you're totally new and you just found us online, if you have questions about anything or you just want to talk, go online. We'd love to connect with you. We love you guys. Y'all have a great week of worship. See you next Sunday.